So we move to the next talk. Michael Dozer, physicist as well, expert in antimatter, working today as a spokesperson of uh, the AGES experiment, working on gravity and matter, antimatter effects. So this is another Sunday <laughs> type of, <Exactly. laughs> of work, yeah. talking about quantum sensing and metrology yeah. activities. Thank you. Okay, so can you just start the presentations? Yeah, this is going to be switching gears completely, um, coming really to the quantum engineering side of things. Uh, I'm supposed to be the coordinator at CERN for quantum sensing, and uh, I'll try to give you an idea of what this is about uh, and how this has any bearing on particle physics. So I'll say a little bit about the context, the overall context, uh, clarify the terms that I'm going to be using, and then talk a little bit about what kind of quantum sensors we can use for uh, low energy particle physics here at CERN, uh, quantum sensors for new particle physics experiments. This is something that John just touched upon, so I will skip over that very quickly. And then uh, flash some ideas about how to use quantum systems for detectors for high energy particle physics. So the overall context is that uh, within the particle physics landscape, high energy particle physics landscape, there has been a roadmap um, that was written last year for the kind of R&D that needs to be done in the coming uh, decades, or probably decade, in different areas relevant for high-energy particle physics detectors. And one of these chapters covered uh, quantum and emerging technology detectors. So I'll be mainly talking about these when talking about high-energy physics detectors, but I'll also be talking about the kind of technologies that really are relevant at the quantum scale. And if you look here, you'll see that all of these technologies are uh, very low-energy, very sensitive devices. There are synergies with other detector technologies, such as particle ID or photon detectors. Well, this is one uh, part of the context. The other one is, of course, the framework of the CERN Quantum Initiative, which uh, is behind today's uh, effort. Uh, what I when I talk about a quantum system, I, I really mean a system that will be sensitive to a change of quantum state caused by the interaction with an external system. So this is either a transition, for example, between a superconducting state and a normal conducting state, a transition of an atom within an atom from one state to another, or the change of a resonant frequency of a system in a quantized manner. So this is basically then the definition of what I understand by quantum sensor as a, a device that allows the measurement um, capabilities of which are enabled by our ability to manipulate and read out quantum states. So, the commensurate energies for these kinds of transitions are very low. And so, unsurprisingly, quantum sensors are ideally matched to low energy particle physics and very poorly matched to high energy particle physics. So I'll try to give you some ideas of what we're doing there. And I will not be talking about the most interesting part of quantum systems, which is entanglement, because I don't find any obvious application of entanglement to high energy particle physics. We'll come up with such ideas in the future, I'm sure, but for now, I will only be looking at these systems here. These systems which allow one to search for new physics beyond the standard model, um, look for axons, axon-like particles, dark matter, tests of quantum mechanics, such as wave function collapse, and tests of fundamental symmetries. And the technologies that are used for probing these low energy physics areas are these here, uh, superconducting devices, uh, spin-based devices, optical clocks, ions, atoms, molecular systems, optomechanical sensors, and metamaterials. Now, at CERN, there is some experience in some of these low energy particle physics uh, areas, and in particular, um, looking for electric dipole moments of electrons in molecules, or trying to produce nuclear clocks. This radioisotope of thorium is something that is being worked towards at Isolde, or trying to build molecular ion clocks but also things like highly charged ions in penning traps, which are extremely sensitive via their uh, very strong scaling to um, beyond QED effects. These systems are very interesting if you're trying to go beyond the standard model with low energy uh, quantum systems. And these would be quantum systems that are particularly sensitive. The area that these quantum sensors have been applied in mostly up to now is looking for uh, dark matter, and in particular, dark matter uh, in the form of axions at low masses. So this is the mass range, the allowed mass range, or actually this is the allowed mass range 
of dark matter candidates. The LHC is up here, somewhere in the GV to TV region, but if you go to the sub-electron volt region, you're going to find that uh, the approach of high energy physics is not the right one. There you're going to have to see things that are, uh, that provide signals in microwave cavities, for example, where there are a number of experiments that are probing around the microelectron volt range. And you have to remember that uh, these axions are now no longer particles, they're extended objects. And so you're going to have to find a match between the size, the wavelength of this axion and the cavity, the microwave cavity that you're working in. You have no idea where to look, so you just build many different cavities. If you want to go below this particular region, your cavity size is going to have to become huge. And uh, there's a work around that that's being worked on right now. So these cavities are going to be sensitive to the axion if, it, if the wavelength is right, but there's also a question of coupling, uh, the, the coupling strength of the axion to the magnetic field in which these cavities are sitting, goes with the fourth power of the magnetic field, and the quality factor of the resonant cavity. And up to now, you could have one or the other. You could either have a very strong field and a poor quality factor, or a very good quality factor, but a very weak field, and you'd like to have both very high, and this is something that is possible to do with novel coatings. Uh, these are superconducting radio frequency cavities that are being coated with thin film high temperature superconductors, such as those being developed here at CERN. And this allows one to go to very strong fields, 11 Tesla, um, and very high quality factors. Uh, there are other approaches to try to also increase the sensitivity, but I'll not uh, talk about those. I will talk though about going a little bit lower in mass, so below micro Kelvin to the nano, sorry, the micro um, electron volt to the nano electron volt region, where one of the experiments at CERN, the antiproton experiment base, is using um, antiprotons as a thermometer. What they're looking at is the noise spectrum of an LC circuit that is coupled to trapped antiprotons, and where in this quality uh, factor, this figure of merit, it's not just the the strength of the magnetic field or the quality factor of the resonator, it's also the temperature of the system that is uh, going to affect how sensitive one can be. And the idea is here to go to as low as possible a system temperature by using cryoamplifiers. So what they've basically built is the highest Q and lowest temperature LC resonant detectors, which use the antiproton spin flips as a thermometer to tell them that they are actually at these very low temperatures. The fact that they can detect the spin flips tells them what temperature they are at, and that then allows them to exclude a certain mass range of axions. So this is a very nice plot, but if you look at the scale here, it's extremely narrow. That's this blue needle here. To go beyond this blue needle into actually a wide range, you have to go to a stronger magnetic field, a broader uh, FFT, but within one month, they should be able to cover several um, decades of uh, sensitivity here and go beyond what other dedicated experiments are currently doing. Ion, thank goodness. John, you already talked about it, so I can skip all this. Um, looking for ultralight dark matter, looking for topological dark matter. This is just the slide that shows how sensitive an atom interferometer in space is in comparison to any other accelerometer that you can put into uh, space in terms of the sensitivity to minute differences in equivalent water height on, uh, over the globe. And as CERN has pointed out, we've got wonderful shafts here that would be an ideal testing ground for the 100 meter scale of this atom interferometer before then going into space, into a satellite mission uh, in about 20 years down the road. So you first have to prove that this works here. There is competition, of course, worldwide, and collaboration. All right, so that brings me away from the low energy particle physics side to the high energy particle physics side. And I have to warn you that because the devices that rely on quantum effects are sensitive to minute changes in energy deposit, the, this is really um, not the ideal device to think about enhancing high energy physics detectors. But there are some few applications that might work and this is very, very speculative. What I'm going to tell you about here are just ideas that are being thought about right now. They may or may not work. 
And they cover basically uh, three areas right now. Um, low dimensional materials, so zero, one, two dimensional materials, so planar, uh, linear, and dot materials, quantum dots and nanolayers. And here I'll be talking a little bit about um, scintillators based on nanodots, a concept of chromatic calorimetry with quantum dots, active scintillators where you use uh, quantum cascade lasers, perhaps, and then um, gems with uh, the use of graphene. Uh, then a little bit of um, the use of molecular system or atomic system in this case to try to build Rydberg TPCs. And then finally, trying to build helicity detectors via uh, spin-based sensors. So the first um, part is about quantum dots. And here it's the timing that is really important. If you look at these quantum dots, they have an extremely fast rise and decay time. Uh, in this case here, this quantum dot has a, a, a rise time of uh, 43 picoseconds. Uh, there are several longer term components. Also here, this um, photoluminescence of uh, zinc oxide, gallium, uh, has extremely fast uh, rise and decay times, 210 picoseconds. And here the, 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 the challenge is to try to get this integrated light yield to be as short as possible uh, and that means you need many photons to be produced inside these nanodots. But if you do that, then you can get light coming out. This can be in the optical range, and the light frequency will depend on the geometry, for example, or on the size of these quantum dots. This is um, a, a, a triangular assembly of uh, carbon nanodots, and each one of these assemblies is just a little bit bigger than the other one, and emits light at a slightly different frequency. In fact, the frequency is extremely well defined by the geometry and the size to within about 20 nanometers. So you can very well differentiate just by measuring the emitted light uh, which size nanodot you're working with. And this allows you to start thinking about doing something very amusing, which is to build a stack of different calorimeter materials, each doped with nanodots of a specific size, that will emit light at a particular color. And because these dots are so narrow, sorry, the, the emission spectrum is so narrow, that means that any light emitted from this one here will be clearly distinguishable from any light emitted here. And furthermore, because the absorption spectrum of, for example, this red nan light emitting nanodot is very different from the uh, absorption spectrum of the same dot here, it means that these dots further down the road will not absorb light emitted further upstream which means that if you have a spectrometer here at the back, you can determine the fraction of light emitted in this part, the fraction of light emitted in this part, and so on. And by building a spectrometer image, or measuring the amplitude in each of these spectral colors, build an image of the shower profile. So you can do a chromatic shower profile measurement. If this works, you have to incorporate these nanodots inside the, uh, the calorimeter objects, and that's going to be a huge challenge. You might also think of using quantum cascade lasers. Quantum cascade lasers are a multi-step process where you have one electron entering here and it goes down stepwise and at each time it drops from one level to the next, it emits light, in this case infrared light, of the same frequency. So from one electron you get many, many infrared photons. Now if you imagine that there's a charged particle coming through here, many, many electrons are liberated in this area here. If you can somehow couple bulk semiconductor to these electron injection layers here, you might be able to get from n electrons here, n uh, photons for each electron times the number of steps. So you might be able to get a very intense signal out of these uh, quantum cascade lasers coupled to bulk silicon which would be de facto an active scintillator. Thinking about graphene, there are two nice things about graphene. One of them is that it's probably the thinnest material you can come up with to cover a box. So you can make a lid here, and this lid inside a, a gem, for example, will let electrons through. They can go through the structure of the graphene, but it will stop any ions from going back. So if you have a layer, a graph monolayer of graphene in, just in the amplification stage of a gem, 
what you get is the electrons can come through and be amplified, but the ions produced in the amplification region will not be able to backpropagate into the drift region, which is where you don't want them. Furthermore, the graphene itself has the possibility of emitting electrons quite easily. So if you cover a photocathode with graphene, you might well be in the situation of being able to enhance the photo uh, emission. I'll just say a few words about the concept of Rydberg atom TPCs. And here the idea is really that normally in a TPC, the electrons come in from the drift region, go into the amplification region, and there they see a very strong electric field, are accelerated, and produce a, an a shower. Now, if the atoms in this region here are, amp are excited into a Rydberg state, so a highly excited state where the binding energy of the electron is very small, just prior to the arrival of the, of the signal here, then you should be able to produce more electrons in the cascade for a single incoming electron which means that you get a effective reduction of the ionization threshold in, of the gas in the amplification region, which corresponds in this case to a higher electron yield. You also get photons from this. The Rydberg atoms can also serve to upconvert terahertz and gigahertz radiation that's produced in this region here into optical uh, signals, which you can then read out. So you actually get a dual readout from this. And this principle carries over to the drift region. If you can excite the atoms in here, you should also be able to get more electrons per track unit length, which means an increased EDX through the standard primary ionization plus the photoionization of atoms excited by MIPS. Now, this is an interesting concept. Uh, it's not going to be trivial to get to work. And the last concept I wanted to mention is the idea of using optically polarizable elements, such as nitrogen vacancy diamonds, uh, where you can spin polarize a defect inside a diamond with microwaves, and then use this spin polarized structures inside the diamonds as a scattering plane for particles. And if you look at what's actually happening at the atomic level, you're scattering a spin polarized particle against a spin polarized target. And by looking at the multiple scattering here, you might be able to extract the spin of the particle. Now, for that to work, you have to have a, a large amount of atoms polarized. Normally, you can get to something like 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 18 uh, nitrogen vacancies inside a per, per cubic centimeter. And then you can use the hyperpolarization that's been um, developed in the last few years that increases the volume of polarization around a single uh, defect by a factor of 100 to get to somewhere around 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 20. That's still not quite enough. You'd like to go up by another further two or three orders of magnitude. But this is just an indication of where one could go with this. And so with all of this, what I'm trying to say is that we need lots of dedicated R&D to evaluate the potential of these ideas and others for high energy physics uh, applications. And uh, of course, any work done on these systems will also benefit the low energy particle physics uh, applications. And with that, uh, I've taken a little bit too long. I apologize. So thank you, Michael. I think we still have time for one or two questions. If No? Everything clear? Uh, if you want to hear more about it, there's a seminar in about a month's time where I will go through this much more slowly. <laughs> you dazed them. Okay, thank you, Michael.